Right. Happy New Year, man. Happy New Year. Thank you for having me. Yeah, man. I, I, thanks for doing this. Uh, I mean, you, you're always a hero to me. Uh, I have with me today, uh, I have with me today Keith, Mr. Jennings uh, from Culpeper, Virginia. Um, I will give you the broad sketches of your career. Um, Keith, Keith was from Culpeper and he went all the way to East Tennessee State, led his team to the NCAA tournament three times, shot an incredible more than 50% from the floor. Uh, um, in, a, in a senior year, which I it's probably unheard of, uh, <laughs> played played a couple of years in the in the NBA um, and for the Golden State, and it, it was a it was a great time for, for small guards before Mr. Jennings came around, uh, before Spud Webb, before Muggsy Bogues came around in, in the seventies. They called Nate Archibald tiny. He was six one. Calvin Murphy was five nine. And we, these yeah. are small guards. And then yeah. all of a sudden, a new generation of, of really small guards came in and really um, ma made their way and really changed the game and, and paved the way for a lot of other small guards to play. And, and Mr. Jennings was a big part of that. Had a, had a nice career okay. over in Europe, sure. Played for a lot of big clubs, uh, Fenerbahce, Real Madrid, uh, Strasbourg, where Scotty Reynolds, is, I believe, is still playing. Um, the last, uh, I guess, uh, almost 20 years or so, he's been coaching. Coach at Highland out in, uh, in Loudoun County. Uh, a lot of folks, he was helping to build those, that program there and bring, uh, bring some big names. Um, he coached with Richard Morgan, um, UVA fame at Bluefield for many years. Yeah. He's the, the women's coach at, at, Lee, at Lee's McCray. So, again, uh, Mr., uh, thanks for doing this. Thank you. Nah, no problem. Uh, you know, Happy New Year to you. You know, it's, it's flattering to hear those kind words from you, man. And, uh, like you say, you know, I just, you know, live my life, try to be the best person I can be. And, you know, if, if I can touch people's lives or learn some things, I'm all for it. Well, well, well speaking of touching people's lives, uh, your, your good friend, C. C. Russell, another great tiny, tiny guard. He posted on, on Facebook. I guess you took a trip out to Golden State and they, they flew you out there. and They wanted you to connect with a guy and you you had been an inspiration to. You, you want to tell us a little bit about about that, about that um, trip? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, it was an awesome trip, you know, and it actually turned out to be way more than I expected because when I first had the conversation with the Warriors about, and actually we, they wanted to do this before COVID hit. So this was like planned like a couple of years ago, but then when COVID hit, it kind of washed everything away. And so I kind of had kept it in my memory bank, but I really didn't know if they were going to revisit it. And then um, I would say probably like three months ago, they had called me again and they were saying, we'd like to get this back on since everything is getting back to some type of normalcy. And uh, I was all for it. They asked me to pick a game. And I, you know, right after I were, right while we were on Christmas break, I saw it with the Denver Nuggets because I played for that organization, but I blew my knee out in the preseason. So I really didn't play a season with them. But just being with the, them and also really playing, that would be a good game to and so, uh, yeah, the young man, Omar, he's a grown man now, but back in those days, ball boy for us. And, you know, just being in, being from the tough hoods in Oakland, you know, I just, sometimes, you know, sometimes they just need some direction and let them know that, you know, there's there's life outside of where you at. Don't, don't think that this is the only place it can happen at. And uh, I guess he took those words to heart and, you know, he started working really hard and he ended up, you know, a, a backstory to that is, he ended up going to college at Norfolk State. And so I have some of my good friends that lived in the area at that time. So I was able to look out for him even when he left Oakland to go and do his thing in Norfolk State. And, you know, just ended up being very proud of that young man. And, you know, it was good to see him the other night. And, you know, we sat there and just chatted. And, you know, he just expressed to me that, you know, he really appreciate, you know, me just looking out for him and giving him something to do because that's what he does now. And that's awesome. Isn't it, isn't it funny how you never know who you're going to inspire in your life? You know, you don't. I mean, that's, you know, my parents, they raised me to be respectful. You know, I, you know, I try my best to respect my elders, you know, because they deserve it. But at the same time, you know, I treat people how I want them to be treated. And, you know, that, that's been working out for me. Oh, that's great. Well, for, for folks who don't know, Culpeper is like 45 minutes uh, north, north of Charlottesville and about maybe 60 miles west of D.C., so I used to pass through Culpeper all the time. I went to the University of Virginia. I, I, used, to, I used to pass through all the time. It's a beautiful town. Um, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an old, kind of a southern little town. Yeah. It's surrounded by a huge it's country. Of, yeah, it is. So I know country. country. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is. We used, to, we used to drive by before the bypass was built. That's how long ago it was. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, 
So anyway, you're, uh, were you born in the town of Culpeper or are you from the uh, surrounding areas? No, I was born and raised in Culpeper. Uh, you know, like I said, it was definitely a small country town where everybody knew each other. Uh, had a lot of support from that hometown of mine. You know, mm -hmm. it's, you know, that's one of the things, sometimes they would misspell Culpeper. They would throw two P's in the middle and I had to correct that. <laughs> like, no, it's only one P in the middle, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. but uh, it was always, once you make your market in your hometown, and then when you go to East Tennessee State, and then they say from Call Pepper, Virginia, it just did something to me. It just was like great to represent, you know, the place that it really all started for me at. And you know, like I said, it's always fun to go home. My mom and dad them still live there, and oh. you know, I was able to go home there for Christmas and everything. So yeah, uh, Call Pepper, awesome little town, man. And you know, I, I would love to get back and speak to the student athletes one day just hasn't been arranged yet but yeah i just want to let them know man you know i came from this town you know you can come from a small town and make something big of your life you know you just got to dream big but work for it and you know just see where where it may where it may end up at we had an old family friend from Culpeper. her name was nancy mack you may even know her she had like 15 kids but she, yes I, I know the max you know Super. she she pronounced it Culpeper. she pronounced it Culpeper, oh, not Culpeper. oh did she that's what she said, because it was confusing to me because it looked like cold pepper. But maybe right. that's, that's how we always grew up saying. Exactly. So tomato, tomato, right? You know. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so so cold pepper ha had a basketball tradition. I, I believe they won the state the state championship around seventy one or seventy two. Early seventies, yep, seventy one, seventy two. Did you did you know those guys? And was it was there uh, was it a basketball culture in in that town? Yes, I mean I think that's where I really started getting the hunger for it because. Some of those guys that were on that state, state championship team were really cool friends with my dad, you know what I'm saying? So later on in life when they're playing spades and they start talking about the old times and I'm listening to it like, wow, you know, I, I can't wait for my turn. And then, you know, it just kind of ran through my family, like my older brother who was shorter than me, but, you know, he played, at, you know, his junior, senior years, he was a starter and he got to play quite a bit. And, you know, that's who really, you know, I'm looking at him like if he can do it. You know what I'm saying? I can't wait for my chance. And when the opportunity came. I just, you know, everybody wanted to win a state title, you know, and unfortunately I never played in a state tournament. But, uh, you know, people after me, some of my best friends, they played in the state tournaments. And, you know, it's just, you know sweet tradition of you know, trying to be the best basketball team when you get a chance to play for Carl Pepper. And did you, did most of your experience come right there? I mean, later on, you played in the, uh, with the Central Virginia AAU team with those guys. I think the guys from Charlottesville, because I refereed your games. So I know you played with them. But did most of your basketball was right there in Culpeper, or did you travel a lot to Richmond and D.C. and play? Or are you just? No, no, mostly growing up in those times, you know, it was just the area. You know, we go to Orange. We were cool with some of the guys there. Uh, we go to Brooks Park up in Fredericksburg. And, and you know, just we just tried to find everywhere to go and hoop and get better, you know? And luckily enough, I had a lot of basketball camps at an early age. And, and even before then, you know, the restrictions of, you can't get in the gym, you know, insurance purposes, we didn't really have that, you know what I'm saying? I was able to get in the gym quite a bit. And, and, and you know, it got to the point where they would let me bring my friends along. And then, you know, it was just a great relationship, a great place to go and play. You knew when you came to our gym to hoop, it wasn't no playing around. It was going to be some really good basketball. And I know that's how I kept my level pretty high once I became a pro. Who, who were your influences? Who, who did you try to play like when you, when you were young? Like I said, my, my older brother, you know, he used to beat me all the time. So that motivation of not liking to lose, you know, getting beat, walking into the house, crying, upset, and, you know, knowing he's not going to take it easy on you, you know, just made you made me work harder. Uh, we said to Max earlier, I know Walter Mack, uh, rest in peace, but he was one of the guys that I remember watch play and was very impressed with him. Um, how about pro, how about pro players? Did you, did you idolize any pro? Isaiah players? Thomas, Isaiah Thomas was like the, my main guy. Um, Kevin Johnson, you know, mm -hmm. I respected his game. And then of course, Muggsy, you know, Muggsy and Spud, they were, you know, pioneers for us. And then you got Michael Adams, Michael you know. Adams chance to play against some of these guys and uh you know i remember meeting calvin murphy one of the first things he said to me i'd post you up <laughs> I, you think now you know so and you know it, and meeting tiny archibald so you know the, the stage was set like you said man and you know the, the smaller 
the smaller basketball player just wasn't getting any love. And I can, I, I know you've seen it. I mean, I've seen them. I know you can go all around the world. A lot of small guys can play, but the basketball is a tall man sport. And so if you can't figure out as a smaller player how to make that adjustment, then your skills are still going to be very nice. You just won't get to show it on the level that I was blessed to show it on because I know you said C. Russell, that guy, he was, you know, one of my, one of the guys that really got me to where I'm at because watching him in the ninth grade, I was like, wow, he's doing stuff that I ain't seeing nobody do but me. And I'm not doing that. So that made me think somebody's out there is working harder. So you better work harder because your paths will cross one day yeah. and you better ready because he embarrassing guys you know yeah. so it was like you say it was a, a bunch of guys that's made impacts and you know it's it's it's, it's, it's all love for me you know I, I love when i get to see mugsy or if i run in the sea all the time or any of the other guys i, I mean it would be nothing but respect because i know it's a small knit group but the brotherhood of basketball as you know is, is it goes to all levels it don't just in the nba yeah, C. Russell, for folks who don't know, is in the Hall of Fame at Slippery Rock. He was a 5'5 guard at Warren County. They got, he took his team to the state tournament. I think the tallest guy was 5'11. They lost yep. to Brian Stith, uh, who ended up winning um, the, the tournament with, with, uh, with Brunswick. But um, to get back to you, so you went, you went to Culpeper, and I, I know that environment. I used to referee there, as I told you. It was a fun place to referee. People right on the court. You always had to smart Alec guys in the front row give me a hard time with their jokes. <laughs> Uh, but I used to love going there. And, and hey, I, wait, I, man, hey. Not to cut you off, but let me apologize because that could have been my dad and my uncle. Man. They was like really rough on the referees, man. So I, I know a couple of them that could have been. Okay, we're, we're all forgiven. No, no, no. So the thank fact you, you, thank you. The fact you did this interview, it's all it's all forgiven. Okay, you know, it, was all, it was all good time. They used they used to carry glasses with them when I walked by. They they yeah. like, <laughs> glasses up and stuff like that. They were just just full, full of jokes. Uh, but uh, I, I believe the guy Billy Thornhill was your coach. Is, is that right? Yes, yes, Coach Thornhill was. And he and he played that. He had played it at Culpeper. Uh, uh -huh. What kind of coach was, was uh, Thornhill? You know, uh, when he asked me to play varsity in the ninth grade, I mean, I didn't even really know I was on his radar like that. You know what I'm saying? So I, I'm thinking my ninth grade year, I'm going to play with my, you know, my Cougar basketball team, the middle school team, and we're going to kill everybody. You know, that's what I'm thinking. And then when he tells me, when he asked me if I want to play on the varsity and, uh, you know, my dad was like, cause I was, you know, when you, when you're able to be the man, that's, that's a good feeling. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm a basketball historian, you know, I've watched all the greats, you know, and how, what they did to the game or what they did for their team made them special. So I, I, I watched wondering what that would be like. And so when my ninth grade year and he offers me to play and I'm a little apprehensive because I feel like I want to be the star here and I might not even play over here. So I'm like, I don't know. But when I talked to my dad about it, the main thing he said was, look, if you want to get better, you got to play against better people. So that kind of sewed it up for me. So I knew at that point, well, I might as well play varsity. And like I say, my freshman year, I learned a lot. But towards the end of that year, I started starting. And so as we ended that year, that next year, coach and I would always talk offense. You know, he felt that I could score, even though I was smaller, he wanted me to shoot the ball a lot more. So I think that's what he helped me with the most because he was a, a big time scorer back in his time. So just talking about different ways to get baskets and things of that nature. I think that's what I learned from him the most because, you know, he gave me the green light. And for those that don't know who the, what the green light is, that means you can at basketball anytime you please <laughs> and at first it kind of shocked me because I'm just a sophomore so you know I got some upper classes that are kind of like why is this little guy getting to do all that but I didn't miss a whole lot even back then so it kind of just came full circle and then after that my junior and senior year he just really turned me loose and you know I was first team all state as a junior and senior and player of the year in our conference and tournament so you know it just set me up for a wonderful high school career. Yeah, so I'm trying to remember who was on your team. There, there was a player named James, left hand that was a great shooter, but he might have been younger. He came right you. after me. He came a little bit after I left. Yeah, he made, when the three-point line came in, I think he made like 13 threes in a game, and, and we worked out all the time. You know, James was uh, like a little brother to me. Yeah. And what, was we, his last, what was his last name? Tom Thompson. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. Yep, yep. Cool guy. Now he's the head coach there, and, and uh, you know, He's the head coach in Culpepper High School. I didn't know that. He's a 
and speak to his team a couple of times, man. So yeah, you know, I, I wish him the best and I always let him know I'm here for him if he ever if he ever needs me for anything. So you guys, you guys never make it a state term. Who who's who who are the teams that knocked you out before you got to states? Uh Robert E. Lee knocked me out every year. Every year. Uh, that's when they had Kevin Madden, uh Todd Dunnings, Mitch Madden. Man, yeah. Uh they just had a had that size and uh you know we i think my sophomore year we had them you know but they ended up scoring a bucket at the end of the at the end of the game which beat us and then um uh, my junior year they smacked us pretty good and then my senior year we fought back but they ended up beating us by about four or five so yeah i didn't I never get by those guys but they were on your aau team right those guys because you played with the central virginia aau team i, I believe right, right. So you, you knew, yeah, you knew those you guys know, really well. That was like a that was like a blur. That was like when AAU really started. And I remember seeing myself and um a couple other, I mean, I don't even really remember the team. Yeah. And I I know I didn't play as well as I had played in the, as, as as a high school player. So right. I was a little disappointed in my performance, but C played really well during that time. But I remember playing against Alonzo Morning them and up at UVA. I was and, there. You know, they had their size, but you know, it, it was tough to overcome that, but it was just a lot of our Central Virginia guys that, you know, we just played hard and, and we got to each other. And like I said, it didn't last nearly like the AAU seasons last now. We just went to a tournament here and there, but now you got that AAU season where you get a lot of time, you know, you get a, a perfect chance to showcase your talents all over all different areas, you know, and I think that's a, that's a bonus for these young players today. Yeah. Well, one thing that was frustrating to me because I was I was at UVA at, at this time. You were Central Virginia Player of the Year. I, I remember that, but I I don't believe UVA heavily recruited you. And one of the reasons may have been because because I think John Crotty was was your year, and they'd yes. already they'd already signed Crotty, and I guess they figured yep. they didn't do two point guards. But people from the area, they're like, you got you got to sign you got to sign Mr. Jennings, but they. <laughs> But they didn't do it. Is that is that recollection correct? Yeah, yeah, that was right. I, they brought me into their camp their senior year, mm -hmm. my, my senior year, and uh, actually, Crotty hadn't signed yet, but Chris Corciani was there. You remember Chris Corciani? They went to yeah, yeah. So he was there, and we were there at the same time. And you know, they would you could tell the difference of those guys. They were giving them a lot of a lot of love. They didn't have to do too much at the camp and things of that nature. Where I was really trying to, you know, work hard to you know show I could play at that level. And then they did sign John Crotty, so that you know really didn't give me that opportunity. And I was kind of disappointed because nobody, no, none of the colleges really in Virginia really gave me a look. You know, I would have, you know, George Mason, Radford, James Madison. I mean, VCU. I mean, Virginia Tech. I would have went to probably any of those Virginia schools, but none of them showed me any interest. Emory and Henry. That, that was like the main school that was really looking at me until East Tennessee State. And then VMI came, was, you know, were really interested also, but I just didn't think I was built for the military school. <laughs> so I was thinking Emory and Henry, but then East Tennessee State came in and I was like, you know, Coach Robinson, we hit it off and he offered me a full scholarship and uh, it was a no brainer. I had to go that way. I don't know much about Coach Les Robinson. What, what, what's he like and, and what's his background? I mean, you know, Coach Robinson is from West Virginia. Uh, um, just a super offensive-minded type guy. You know, I feel like I got along better with offensive coaches. You know what I'm saying? Where Coach Thornhill was offensive-minded as far as green, giving me the green light. Coach Robinson was offensive-minded as far as sharing the ball, but letting me take over the game, knowing if I had that ability to do so. He was never like, hold back, mister, you know, do get other people involved. So... Our relationship was great. Um, you know, it was unfortunate that he had to leave our senior year to go to NC State to coach mm -hmm. respect. I mean, when you play somewhere and you get a chance to go back there and coach, I think that's a lot of former players' dreams because, you know, when that opportunity you're given by them, you get a chance to give it back, you're going to work hard for them. So, yeah, Robinson was a super nice guy. Uh, his family, very sweet family, and I, I really enjoyed playing for him. So you go from double A ball in, in Virginia, which is back then was, was the middle classification, and you go right to the to the college game. Was it was it a big adjustment for you? I mean, again, none of the Virginia schools recruited you, not even not even Radford, who takes a lot of the in-state players. 
or um, Mason who takes a lot of the in-state players, VMI came in late. Was it an adjustment for you? Or were you able to right away feel comfortable and do your thing? I mean, it was, it was an adjustment because I didn't have anybody to lean on to tell me what to expect about going to play college basketball. You know, you go to basketball camps and you play against players that are supposed to be going to bigger schools and you're trying to measure yourself to see, you know, how they are and how you can be if that's the case. So, you know, I, I never really thought too much about it, but at the same time, I know when East Tennessee came along, it was going to be, they, they were getting a shooting guard coming out of high school. And I knew I was going to have to transition to the point guard. So that I knew was going to be the weights. I, we lifted in high school, but it really wasn't a big thing. So that adjustment of being, I was kind of intimidated when I'm in the weight room for the first time and I see these upperclassmen and they're lifting all these weights and I'm still in the background like, oh, I'm supposed to lift that, you know? And you got some of your upperclassmen that are encouraging like, Hey, don't worry. You're gonna get stronger, man. Start getting the confidence, and you understand that. That start to think like, if I'd have did this my senior year, I really might have been, you know, I might have been really unstoppable just with the extra strength. But you learn that going into college, so I think that adjustment, and then knowing, even though I am a shooting guard in high school, I can be a passer. I I knew how to do that, you know. So adjusting in those two ways, they, they were kind of easy for me. And once something easy, all you got to do is, at that point is keep getting your reps in, keep working, keep believing, and keep playing. And, you know, I, my motto was if I can stay consistent early in my career, then by the time I'm a junior and senior and you know how to be a pro, it just becomes easy at that point. The game seemed physical. I mean, they, they try to beat on you a little bit when you play college. Because, you know, like, at UVA, they played that chest-to-chest -chest defense, like John Crotty. He'd beat, he'd beat the crap out of you when you, used to, when you drove by him. Did the game seem physical to you when you, when you, when you went to college? No, nah, not really, because I was elusive. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I was, I was kind of stocky, but I was crafty enough to, oh, trust me, once you start learning that you're a target and you start getting these hard screens, mm -hmm. whether it's back screen or you playing hard defense and all of a sudden out of nowhere, big guy sets a screen, you don't want to keep taking those. So you learn to avoid that contact. So at that point now, when you become good and people know, like you just said, you got to be physical with him. He's smaller. He, he might not be tough. I mean, I played football, so I, I, I didn't mind the physicality of basketball. It's not the same as football, but at the same time, that contact, if you ain't ready for it, it can hurt you. So learn how to avoid stuff like that. I became smart with that. But yeah, I mean, when you're like the number one man on your team and you're a smaller guard like me, yeah, when you go to the basket, knock him down, put him on his butt, set hard screens on him, give him fouls. I mean, I've talked to opponents that have been like, you know, I fouled you on purpose. I'm like, yeah, I, I, it's, it always happens. Yeah. <laughs> That's basketball to an extent. But, you know, you just got to, you know, be ready for those, those moments. And I know you said Coach Robinson was an offensive coach. Are there things you learned from him that you still use in your in your coaching today? Yes, I mean, I mean, we had two. Alan LaForce was the assistant, and he was the defensive guy. And he became our head coach my senior year, and so I was all for his toughness in the defensive realm of it because you know they say defense wins championships, and I believe that. Even though I'm an offensive minded coach, so when the things Coach Robinson did offensively and then what Coach LaForce kind of still did but concentrated more on defense, I kind of teach and coach in both of those forms. You know, if you got somebody that's talented enough that you can give a little bit more freedom to, then, yeah, I'm going to give them that freedom. But if not, Coach Robinson was good as – like, I played with four other guys that scored over 1,000 points. So mm -hmm. a lot of buckets with only one basketball. So mm – -hmm to be selfless to an extent you got to be willing to sacrifice a, a a good shot for a great shot and then you got to work on your skills because when that opportunity comes to you like i like you said i mean i shot 59 percent that's crazy so teammates know mister is not going to miss that much so i make my shots when i get the chance you know what i'm saying so it was a it was a good respect that i learned from both of them and you know, I'm trying to teach it to the women's side, but, you know, it's a little difficult, but I think they're going to pick it up hopefully sooner rather than later. Yeah, I, I have never heard of a player who shot as many threes as you did make the high percentage. I've, I've seen that high percentage of guys who shoot one or two a game, 
But you, you, you shot five or six a game, and you shot almost 60%. That is uncanny. I guarantee that's still a record. I, I didn't look before I came on, but that's right. unbelievable shooting. Yeah. I haven't heard anybody that shot higher than that at, at uh -huh. this point. Maybe one person, they, but I don't, like you said, I don't think they shot as many threes as I shot. Maybe so, one or two a game, maybe. Yeah. And the crazy part about this, Julian, was towards the beginning, I was saying like the first 10 games, you know, like now you can go on the internet and see everything, but you know, you'd have to wait for the USA Today to come out. Yes. Good night. Like percentages and stuff. And I can remember I became friends with Jason Matthews, who played at Pitt back in the day. And he's a three point shooter. And I can remember after our season was over, we're playing in the college all-star game and we we're just hanging out talking. And he was like, man, when I looked at your early season percentage, it said that you shot 75% from the three. I was like, there's no way you can shoot 75% from the three without shooting four, only like one or two threes a game. And then I noticed you shot more threes than I did at the time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing how I was shooting the ball that year. It, I mean, it was probably... I can't think of a better shooting year from my college to high school down at that point because it was just a remarkable shooting year. But I put the work in all the way from high school to college, so it wasn't like it was luck. It was a lot of 6 a.m.s, making 200 jump shots, mm -hmm. off the dribble, with my, just playing by myself. Sometimes my brothers would rebound for me and stuff. So, I mean, we don't have that shooting gun like they got now. If I had that shooting gun, who knows what I what kind of percentage I could have shot? <laughs> Two of the nicest guys you ever meet, both from Virginia, uh, uh, Mr. Jennings and Doug Day. I would love to see a three point shooting contest with these two guys. Well, I he I did a podcast with Doug just three or four days ago. Just a night. I'm sure you know Doug because he's he's from Blacksburg and played he played at Radford, uh, just like you. I mean, just buckets. I mean, he just come out there just shooting threes. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, Doug is one of those guys. I mean, I, I don't know him personally like that, but his stories, I mean, basketball players, his stories about other basketball players. And yeah. his has come up a few times. I'm surprised our paths didn't really cross like okay. that. You know, just just like you said, when you brought his name back up, I was like, yeah, shooter. You know, you, you know right away. Some names you hear, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah he was what? So uh, before we get to your, your sophomore upset and, and getting into the NCAA tournament, which had to be historic, I want to talk about Calvin Telford. So we, we, we started this Facebook group for Northern uh, Virginia basketball players, which you've joined. Uh, we're, so, we're so glad to have you. And we, we talk about the heroes and stuff. And you know, Calvin Telford wasn't from Northern Virginia, but we've heard about this guy so much because everyone likes talking about him as highlights. Who, who was Calvin Telford and, and what was he like? What was it like to play with, play with him? Man, I, I, Calvin Talford is a program changer. I mean, when he first, when I first saw his dunk highlight tape in high school, that first year at East Tennessee State, we won like 14 games. And I was like, okay, I think, you know, we got a chance of being really good. And then I'm, I'm meeting the recruits as they're coming through and everything. And before Calvin comes through, I get to see his highlight tape. And after, and it was one of, it was like still to this day, I can watch that highlight tape like it's of today's dunks because it, it was that impressive. And so I'm asked, talking to Coach uh, Robinson, like, do we got a chance to get him? And they were like, yeah, we got a really good chance. And so for it to finally happen, and he comes to East Tennessee State, I was the type that I'm going to pass the ball to my new guys because I need to know like, if they can shoot it. What I, you know, where I need to, where they like the ball at and all that good stuff. So I'm knowing he can dunk, but now I'm just rebounding and kicking out to him. And now he's hitting a, like 19 foot or 20 foot. And I'm like to myself, like, hey man, do they know you can shoot? <laughs> <laughs> They're recruiters, they gotta know. I mean, this is the steal of a player. We, you look at his athletic ability and you're like, that's what it is. But then you see he can also shoot it. And then he's tough as nails. So he was the one that really, I think changed our program, man. I never threw an alley oop too high. Once I figured out he could really go get it, I mean, it was times that I was just really testing him to see if he was gonna go. And he, I never felt, I never threw one too high for that guy. Yeah. Uh, super nice person too, man. And like I said, he's he's one of him, Marty Story, and Greg Dennis. Those four won four consecutive Southern Conference tournament championships. 
to do that, you got to be, you got to be on your game. And, you know, he's, and I just read, we both got selected into the, I think it's the hundredth all-time team in the Southern mm-hmm. Conference. And, you know, it's an honor to be on that team with him. And uh, like I said, he was just a, a joy to play with. He was tough, uh, basketball mind. He, he was smart. He just scored. I mean, I, I can't say nothing bad about his game. Yeah. The only thing I didn't like about him, his freshman year, we were eating lunch and he pulled my chair from under me and I fell out. <laughs> That's what it is. I didn't pass the ball for him, to him for about two weeks after that. But in the game, I passed it to him. I got to get it to him. I hate, pra- I hate practical jokes. Just to give a little, know, right? yeah, just to give a little detail for people, uh, uh, Cal- Calvin was from Castlewood, Virginia. It's Apple in the foothills of the Appalachia. Kind of yes. small schools, great basketball tradition, crazy basketball atmosphere there. So he's kind of a guy just kind of slipped slipped through the cra- slipped through the cracks, kind of like yes. This. You yes. mentioned Greg Dennis. Is that Greg Dennis from Western Carolina that you mentioned? Is that who you're well, talking about? No, he was from Charleston, South Carolina. Okay. okay. You're talking about something uh, He was our okay. big guy. He was our big guy. He was like 6'11. Gotcha. He broke his foot my senior year, which, you know, after that year, we thought we were ranked in the country. And with him, I mean, without him, we got up to number 10. So we were thinking, just what if? You know, you know, in basketball and life, what if this happened? What if this player played against this player? What if I would have did this instead of that? Yeah. What if? Would have been healthy our senior year. You know, it's yeah, it's fun. Always yeah. wonder, but yeah, truly, truly special player he was. Yeah. Well, so look, your your, your sophomore year, you guys, you, you go right at it. You're, I think you finished third in the um in the Southern Conference, and then you an upset in the in the conference tournament, and you go to the NCAA tournament and you play Oklahoma with uh, Mookie yes. Blaylock. Do you, do you remember that yes. game? Oh man, yes, that's one of the you know, when you retire and you look back on your career, you're like, definitely games you'll never forget, you know. And um, that game so early in our college careers, I, I think it didn't do anything but just make us hungry because when you win the conference tournament as sophomores, I mean, I won conference tournaments in high school, so I, I kind of understood the feeling. Like I said, there was a little parallel. So when you win it as a sophomore again, and you're like, I, I like this feeling. We got to get back to that. But before you can, now you go to the NCAA tournament and this is a tournament that I'm in a basketball family. I mean, dad, mom and dad used to let us stay up at 1130 to watch that Pacific Coast game, knowing we got to get up and go to school in the morning and we're going to be dragging. So we we knew that. So to finally play in that was exciting in itself. And so to get matched up with Oklahoma, one of the best teams in the country, you're wondering like, whoa, but you, you're young and you're brash at that time. So you don't really go in it thinking, Oh, this is Stacy King. This is Mookie Blaylock. This is uh, Skeeter and Brian Davis. I mean, you don't think of it. You just let's hoop. You know what I'm saying? Because we got a chance to come back. This is our first year, so let's just go hoop. And the next thing you know, we up on them, and we're like, "Yo, we can beat these dudes, man!" And next thing you know, I fouled out with like a minute and twenty seconds left, and we lose by one. What if we didn't foul out? You know what I'm saying? That's always what if we got that we did get one more shot but we didn't get a good shot. You know, if I would have been in the game because I was controlling the game, maybe we could have got something good, better than the half court heave, you know? Yeah. So that game just made us hungry to get back for the next year. And I think whatever we did that sophomore year, we just added new pieces and then we just played harder and we ended up getting back there again the junior year and senior year. So we, we knew what it takes, you know, what it took to get there. And it wasn't easy, even though I never got out of the first round, you know, but next year they got, they, I think they upset Arizona and, and we lost to the Fab Five, but I know I had something to do with that because, you know, you with somebody for so long and when you leave, they still carry on that tradition and that's what you love being a part of. Well, that's what we love starting at East Tennessee. Yeah, I mean, how, how many players who go to mid-majors can say they've been to three NCAA tournaments? And you won, you won, I think you won three conference tournaments as well. I mean, that's that's yeah. an amazing record. And you know, one thing about the big dance, they're, they're not gonna give East Tennessee State a big a, a good seating. So you, you no. know <laughs> so as soon as you get there, you, you're gonna be playing some lottery picks or you're gonna be playing some, you know, some really talented teams. That's just the way it is. It is, it is. I mean, it was fortunate enough, at least when we played at Vanderbilt against Oklahoma. That was only like about a three and a half hour trip. So that really, you know, we had fans show up for that. And I think that following year, we uh, had to play Georgia Tech. 
but that was right at Knoxville. So that was only like an hour and some change. So we felt like that was a really good opportunity, but Dennis Scott, Kenny Anderson, Brian Oliver, they was tough. Yeah. They, and then now the one that disappointed me was our senior year because we were ranked as high as number 10 in the nation and we won 28 games. That's but right. they went way out to Minneapolis and gave us a 10th seed. A 10th seed, number 10 in the nation? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we couldn't believe it, Jay. We was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Oh, well, but then we ended up losing. I had AC Earl and Coach Davis. They just, I, it was funny. I was actually shooting 60% from the three, and 60% from the field, and 90% from the foul line going into that last game. And I was like four for 13. Mm-hmm. And so that down to like 59.7 for the three and like 59.2 from the field. I was that close to being a 60 60 guy, which is unheard of from the three, from the field. Unheard of. That'd have been that'd have been really crazy. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, your college career is over. Uh, I mean, a spectacular career. Here's, here's a guy that was not recruited at all in his home state with the three NCAA tournaments. And now you're looking at the next step. Now, I, I know you didn't go right to the NBA. You went to Germany for a year. So, so what was the process uh, for you finally getting to Golden State? I mean, well, you know, the little part that people didn't realize is I didn't get drafted, so I was a rookie free agent. And so the Indiana Pacers invited me into their their rookie free agent camp. And that was the first time I really learned the difference in the NBA and college. You know, because I can remember being my senior year, best player in the country on the six feet, led the nation in assists, uh, shooting the ball 59% from the three, looking at smaller, other smaller players like Muggsy and Spud and Greg Grant, I think Greg Grant was the real one that I looked at and was like, if he in the NBA, I know I can get in the NBA because I know those guys didn't shoot it as well as I did. But it was funny that Greg Grant happened to be my roommate when I went to Indiana. So I went there and I'm like, oh, he here. Okay, I'm getting ready to show him, show him what's up. <laughs> he was around me, Jay. I mean, it was I was catching cramps in my legs. Whoa. My team. And bad, they cut me after the third day. And at that point, I was like, I definitely ain't ready for the NBA because the Milwaukee Bucks wanted me to come to their rookie free agent camp. But at that time, I was like, you know what? I don't think I'm ready. My agent told me it was a team in Germany that was very interested in me playing. Um, You know, I prayed about it because it was a team in Australia also. And I thought about going there. But my younger brother was in the army in Germany. And I just felt like I was going to be closer to him. So I go to Germany. And he turned out to be like an hour and a half away from me. And like I said, me and my brothers are really close. Me and my older brother, my young brother, it's like, they're my best guys. And, you know, it was fun playing over there because he happened to be like an hour and a half away. So him and some of his army buddies could come up to some of the games. And it was good seeing, you know, the Americans that know how we act. You know, they announce another team. They got the newspapers up. You know, they, they don't even understand what they doing. But when they introduce us, they just go crazy. I can't, I'd never forget that. And uh, Germany was a good place. They, they gave me an opportunity to, uh, you know, when you're playing overseas, the foreigners, they want you to score. So, you know, I, I came from college where even though I, I scored close to 20 points a game, I still averaged like a, a good amount of assists. So now when you become a pro, now you kind of like, well, I ain't really got to pass as much. Now I can really start to show I can score a little bit. And, you know, I made a, made the all-star game. Actually, it was an all-star game MVP in, France, in Germany my first year. Uh, we made it to the playoffs. We, we won in the first round, lost in the second round. But we took a trip, you know, during like, it was like during the Christmas break where you got the national team games, where we had like three players on our national team. So they couldn't go with us. But the rest of us went to Northern California, West Coast to play a bunch of games. And one of the nights... I think we had just played Stanford. We just played Cal. Um, and we just get ready to play San Francisco. And San Francisco was the last game before we had to go back to Germany and finish up our season. And so I was, you know, the three-point line in college is different than the three-point line in, in the pros, right? So now I'm back to shooting the shot where I was shooting 59%. So I was lighting that college, you know, the college court up. And when we played San Francisco, I had like 42 points, like 15 rebounds, like seven, eight assists. 
very thrilled with the game and walking off the court, the guy from the Warriors, Ed Gregory, he was their player personnel director who happened to come and watch that game. And after the game, he, I'm walking off, he taps me on my shoulder. He's like, I'm I'd like to invite you back to our rookie free agent camp. And so now the wheels are turning like, and he asked me who my agent was. And I told him Herb Rudoy was my guy from Chicago. And he said he was going to get in touch with him. So now I'm like, okay, I didn't have, didn't have anything to learn by going to Indiana, just was humble. But now, and I pray to God, if I get another opportunity, I'm, I'm going to treat it like I'm not as good as I think I am yet, you know. And so when the state gave me that second opportunity, I was totally different than I was in Indiana. I was in, like, great shape. I was more confident in what I was trying to do and what kind of player I was going to be. And, you know, I got past that stage and Coach Popovich really liked me because, you know, that it was good learning from him real quick because, you know, after he leaves us and goes to the Spurs and win that championship, I, I like to think that, you know, I was one of the first summer league teams that he coached. That and we won the league championship that year. So it was, a, it was a good start. And I remember Coach Nelson comes sitting beside me one of the games and I'm like shocked. I'm like into the game. And out of my peripheral, I, I see him sit beside me and I'm like, uh-oh, you know, just wondering what he's going to say. And he was like, how you doing, Mr. Jennings? I'm Coach Nelson. And I was like, how you doing, Coach Nelson? To shake his hand, but trying to stay locked in. He gave me a couple pointers and he right then told me, I want you to come back to our veterans camp and see if you can make our team. And so now I'm getting a little bit closer even more now. So now I'm like, okay, I got past the summer league. Now I'm getting ready to go to the veterans camp. So you get to the veterans camp. And now you're starting to see Chris Mullen walk in the gym. And this is, this is pick up just before we start any of the training camp. And then Tim Hardaway walk in the gym. And mind you now, we don't have all this internet and stuff, but I, I know who Tim Hardaway is. I, I know who Chris Mullen is. I know who Billy Owens. I know who these guys are. I know they don't know me. <laughs> Coming from East Tennessee State, the little five seven guy, I know they don't know me. But just getting into that realm of now I get to play with the best because I think if you played the game of basketball and you're playing pickup and you don't get picked up, you see 10 people out there on that court, you're kind of sizing them up like, I don't like that. I should be out there with them. So now when you get to the NBA and you're out there on the court with these guys, now it's like, I got to show these guys I can play. I think basketball, a lot of times, it's not about the fundamentals. It's about the showmanship of these guys that you're playing with. Because if they believe that you can play, then your confidence really just shoots up. But if they don't believe you can play, then you might not get the ball. You know, it just, it just might not happen that way. But they saw from day one, I could, I could shoot the ball. Uh, my size was not, a, a, wasn't a, a weakness. You know, even though, of course, Timmy posted me up a lot, switched. People post me up a lot, but it wasn't easy, you know? I mean, I just they just knew that. So I gained their respect. And then next thing you know, I ended up making the team and it was a dream come true. I mean, I can tell you a real quick story. When I found out I made the team, I was sitting in the locker room and we were getting ready to, the team was getting ready to go to Utah and I didn't know what was happening. Tim Hardaway actually walks in the locker room and he asked me, he's like, yo, you make the team? And I'm like, no, I haven't heard anything yet. My agent hasn't called. I don't see the so-called pink slip in my locker saying that you got to go home. So I'm just like waiting to hear because this game didn't be crunch time, right? And he goes to the lock, goes to the locker room with the phone in the locker room, picks the phone up, calling somebody. I'm sitting there looking at him like you looking at me and I'm like, not knowing. Could this be one of these rookie things that they do to the rookies? Is he pranking me right now? He's like, yo, this is Tim. I just want to know that, uh, that Mr. Jennings, he make the team. I'm looking at him like, and he's looking at me, he gives me the thumbs up. Jack, when I tell you, I had to make sure, I'm like, come on, stop playing. He was like, man. I mean, I can't tell you the emotions that went through my body. I was running around in the locker room like, I can't believe it, I made it. I can't wait to call him. Get off the phone. Let me call my mom and dad. I mean, as soon as he got off the phone, I called my mom and dad. I could hear the excitement in their voice. Oh, I baby made it. I baby made it. You know, it was just like something that I will never forget. And after that, you know, you just try to live your NBA journey. You know, you, you go through your ups and you go through your downs. And hopefully at that time, you're able to play well enough where people respect you, you know. And, and 
and to go back to Golden State and know that they are honoring me to being in their 75th, uh, it was like mind blowing to me. You know, I played there for three years and to be given that, you know, that, that was just a, a wonderful, uh, just something else that I can look back on my career and be very proud of. So you're talking about you're talking about Hardaway a little bit. You got to see that crossover up close. What was like? What was it like to get that crossover every day in practice? I, I mean, you know, you never think somebody's gonna really shake you enough to make you fall down, but he did. I ain't gonna lie. I mean, it's, if if you would have been on video and you could have seen it, it would have been like the reactions that everybody else sees now. Oh, oh! It was like it was like that. But me, I just got right back up. I ain't gonna lay down there. I got right back up. That was the only time he hit me with it where I fell. So, but seeing it on John Stockton's face or seeing the fear in Jason Kidd's face or any guard we were playing, I quickly realized I wasn't the only one that looked like that. Exactly. <laughs> Those guys looked like they were scared too. Yeah. Well, well, Chris Chris Mullen was an interesting guy. He played in the Big East a very, very gritty time. I mean, there were yeah, fights. It was, tough. It, was a, it was a hardcore 80s. And Chris, Chris Mullen was kind of a, just kind of a, um, you know, just a, like a regular guy. He wasn't like the best athlete in the world, but he was always cool. Got that great left hand shot. Uh, but what was what was he like per, uh, personally? Was he was he a good guy to hang around? Yeah, I mean, you know, the thing about the NBA, a lot of guys are married, so they kind of got their own family. So after you hoop, after you practice, it's not too much hanging out with them at home. But they're going home to do daddy or do the husband thing. Mm -hmm. You know, just as a teammate with the time that I did get to spend with Chris, man, I mean, like you said, he played, I mean, he's from New York. He played in that Big East where, you know, Patrick Ewing, uh, Girl. Villano, I mean, yeah. Ralph, I mean, all of them. I mean, well, Ralph was in the ACC, but I'm sure they played at some point. Yeah. So it was no softness in him. He, you could tell yeah. he had confidence in his game that, you can be, and I can almost say, everybody that matched up with him was more athletic, but he gave out so much work because he was so much smarter. His IQ was so much better than a lot of people that he played. I mean, he was the reason that jerk around foul, if you think about it, he was the one that started drawing that foul yeah. more than now they do it a lot in the NBA. But I was watching him do that, you know, in the early 90s, you know, just finally catching on to that. but. Um, just recently when I got to talk with him, you know, the, I felt the love. We had a good vibe on the court together. You know, we caught each other a lot of back doors. He saw the game like I saw the game. So it was, you know, great. And then, like I said, I'm, I, I respect the game. If I have to play with one of the 50 greatest, I'm going to pick his brain. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to try to find out, you know, what you do, you know, and, he was always receptive, man. And like I said, he was probably one of my favorite warriors to play with. But I, I got quite a few of those guys. So yeah, I enjoyed a lot of those guys. Well, I want to talk about your coaches a little bit. Don Nelson played for the Celtics in the 70s with, with those teams, that the Havlicek's and the, the Paul Silas's, JoJo White's and those, and those guys. As a coach, he was he was an innovator. He he was a guy he, well, the point forward position with yeah. uh, you know with, with at, at Milwaukee he played with, he played a small lineup with um, with Moncrief and uh, Paul Pressy Paul Pressy was his point forward but he was always willing to think outside the box so if there was a coach that you could play with as an undersized guard it's it's Don Nelson because he he thought yes. outside the box is that right yes totally agree he played Timmy and I together a lot um, both of us were compact and strong you know what I'm saying so. It was nothing for me to guard the point guard and him to guard the two guard. But then on the other end, two guards were having problems with him. And if you helped off of me, he was not afraid to kick it to me and I could hit that. So, yeah, Coach Nelson, you know, I, I love to be able to coach a team like he was able to coach a team. You know, he takes advantage of matchups, like you said. I mean, and that's kind of how I coach now with my team at Lee's McCray. I try to put girls that I know that can handle the ball in those type of situations where, you know, the defense might not be used to a forward running the pick and roll because the forward usually steps out on the pick and roll on defense, you know. But, you know, you got to you gotta have the talent to really be able to do that. But definitely, I think Coach Nelson was a, a coach's player, and he always kept you on your toes, man. You know, I remember one day he came to me after practice and was like, little man, why should I keep you? And I'm like, 
uh -oh, not knowing all kinds of things are flowing through my head. And what I came out was, with was, well, Coach Shooter, I'm exciting. <laughs> he looked at me and said, exciting, huh? Well, you are that. And then he just walked on away. When he's walking away, I'm like, maybe I should have said I'm a, I'm a, the best shooter you got, maybe. But I know Chris Mullins on the team, so I don't know if I really say that. But it's like I said, he's always want to make sure you're thinking. And, you know, I, I try to do things with my team the same way. I want to keep you on your toes, but it's on you to get better and it's on you to perform when you get the opportunity. Well, and then you mentioned earlier Popovich was your summer league coach, and, and Popovich is one of the greatest coaches in, in the world right now. He's, he's on top of the world. He's, he's been there for a while. Did, did you sense that he was going to be so successful? I mean, I really didn't know. When he was the assistant at Golden State, all I, all I knew was that at that time with Pop, he was taking an interest in you, and it wasn't just about basketball. You know what I'm saying? I think that was one of the things he was able to do well. Every time we would chat, it seemed like, you see CNN last night? What you think about that baseball game? You know, who you like in football? You know, it was never like basketball. Let's talk at pounding in the ground basketball. So I think his ability to know what he's talking about and people respect it, but at the same time, let's talk about your family. Let's talk about some other things that are, what's, what else is important to you? You know what I'm saying? He came at you at that. And I think a lot of times players feel that's a, that's a great coach to be able to talk to, you know, because a lot of times coaches, you know, they got to coach every player. So it's tough to be like, let me open up to one player or not. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. I think the coaches find a way to do that and their players play hard for them, which brings championships. Yeah. Well, your, your, your final year in Golden State, the wheels kind of fell off the team. You had talent, but the, the record was bad. Nelson ended up leaving. And then after the season, you, you left Golden State. What, what, what happened in that last? What happened that last year? I mean, like you said, uh, contract issues, uh, disgruntled players. Mm. You know, that was in the game. And that year when we traded Chris Webber, because we knew when we got him that rookie year and, and the year that he put on, the performance he had, and you know, just coming out of college and where he was a, a top gun, and now you come to the NBA and the franchise is pretty much on your shoulders as a young guy and you uphold that rookie of the year and do your thing. But then things happen contract wise that next year where they trade you that kind of deflated us because even before he got traded, we were like seven and one. And we're like, when Webb come back, we're about to kick this in another year, but then he gets traded mm -hmm. and that kind of changed everything. And you go from being seven and one to all of a sudden now 25 and 57, you know what I'm saying? It was a, it was a tough, the tough year, but I quickly realized that as a professional, you, you have those type of years, but the bonus is you're getting paid to do what you love to do. So it would it, have been tough to have a tough year in college where you're not getting paid at all. And you got to deal with a lot of losses. That was, that was a lot of losing that year. I, I don't like losing, but you know, you just got to figure out a way to try to get better. And like you said, when that year was over, you know, it was unfortunate that was my last year with them, but, you know, uh, I ended up going to Spain after that and then coming back and blowing my knee out with Denver, but then finished my career up overseas. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm really thrilled on how everything turned out. Yeah. Well, one thing that's interesting is that you played at in, in places where incredible football clubs, soccer clubs, Fenerbahce yes. is, is an incredible Turkish, Turkish club. You played at Real Madrid, which, um, unbelievable uh, soccer team, you know, one of the best two or three in the world. Yes. Currently, uh, you played at uh, Strasbourg. What, what, did, did you get into the, the soccer culture? Did you go to the game? Did you meet any? Uh, other I mean, I mean, as much as I might have wanted to, soccer, I'm a score. I like to see scoring. That soccer of 90 minutes, of zero, zero, and people are like, that's a great game. I'm like, no, it's not. I can't do this. Yeah. I can't do it. So you're right, though. I remember in Real Madrid, you know, being on the basketball side of the soccer side. I mean, the soccer was huge. Yeah. And we had opportunities to go to get tickets and go to those games. But I never was like, I got to go see them play. Yeah. I just didn't do it because I need more action. I, I'm more of an action type guy. But you're right. My teammates, you know, in France, the one of the years, I think in 99, 2000, when I came back to Le Mans, they had just won the French, the World Cup. And so my teammates 
a lot of my teammates were nice with the soccer ball. You know what I'm saying? You know, I, I think it would be like you come over here to us, you'll see we can play football, baseball, basketball. You go over there, it's basketball and soccer. I didn't see like any other sports really. So a lot of times for our conditioning, these guys will be playing soccer. They bring a soccer ball in and they were really nice with their feet. And I would just sit on the side or just ride the bike, but I just couldn't do it. But I mean, you're right. It was a couple very rich soccer teams and, you know, the, the fans that I played or the guys I played with, they really was into that. But yeah, I, I wasn't the biggest soccer fan. Nah. Right. Did, did you enjoy, what, what was it like? What were the racial, what was the racial atmosphere like for, for a black player in, in Europe? Did you, and you, and you were in, in Turkey and did, did you, did, did you feel accepted? Did you enjoy it? You know, the, 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 the blessing for me in those situations were most of the Americans that I played with, I, I, was, I won't say they were all black, but, you know, you got nationalized people on these teams that, you know, they married that 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 nationality and they become that, but they're really Americans. So I, so I got to play with, you know, some guys that everybody spoke English. And another bonus was in these major cities that I got to play in, English is like the second language. So a lot of my French teammates or Spanish teammates or German teammates, all of them had some type of English that they could help translate for me, which made uh, it made it really enjoyable in those places that I did play. And fortunately, you know, some other people might play in a lower division where the coach might not even speak English like that. They are now some tough situations. So I think when people think about overseas ball, they're like, oh yeah, let me get overseas. Now nah, it just depends on where you at and what you know, because you know, I took Spanish in high school Never thought I was going to play in Spain. I was out to pay them a lot more attention than Spanish. Exactly. Yeah. Help me. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. you know, you, you live and you learn. But, yes, I played in some wonderful cities, met some wonderful teammates, still friends with a lot of those guys. And, uh, yeah, yeah I, when things get better, I look forward to going back and visiting some of these places if, if time permits. Did, did your level of play ever get back to where it was at Golden State? Did you? Um, did, I know you hurt your blood, your knee. Did, did you, were you able to get your level of play back to, to the old Mr. Jennings? Yes, actually, uh, in France, I was MVP of the league my second year there because when I when I blew my knee out my second time with Denver, when they released me, I went to France for the first time. I think it was like '98, and so at that season, I still was really recovering from my second ACL but I was able to get through the season. I played with a, a, a good friend of mine that his name is Josh Grant. I don't know if you remember him. He played at Utah. Yeah. We played at Golden State for a little bit. Sure. Uh, he got me to come over there. And that first year, I was only about like 75, 80%, but I was getting through it. But I knew once I got healthy, I'm like, when I really get healthy, I'm gonna kill this league. And <laughs> that's kind of what happened that next year. I was MVP of the league. I was made the all-star team once again over there. and you know, ended up making some pretty good money during that time. So, yes, it was uh, definitely a, a great, fun experience. And, you know, being an all-star probably in, like, different countries and four other countries, I mean, a lot of people don't know that about my career. But, yeah, I, I had – but, you know, I think they understood the small player over there. You know, I don't think they had seen the likes of me anyway, somebody that can really shoot it with range – but still got one-on-one -on -one to get by you and can make his teammates better. I, they, they really hadn't seen that. So it was, it was good. And I think a lot of people remember me and, you know, I helped pave the way from Shante Rogers, other little small play, smaller players to come over there and do their thing. Just like some of those guys did for me before I got over there. Were there any uh, really great coaches you played for in Europe that, uh, that you learned things that you still use today in your coaching? I mean, probably my favorite guy ended up being the French national team head coach. His name was Alan, Alan, Alan Weiss. And, um, and the guy that's, that coached the French national team this past summer, Vincent, I can't remember his last name, but he was Alan's assistant when we were all together at Le Mans. So those two, I know them coaching me definitely probably got them ready for Tony Parker, when he was coming up, like Boris Diaw, some of these young French players, I saw them when they were like younger guys coming up before they came to the NBA. So uh, Allen was like one of my favorite. He was the first pro coach 
that gave me the freedom that I had in college. And so any player that's going to love a coach that gives you a lot of freedom. So, you know, he, he was like, Keith, score the ball. Everybody, pass the ball to Keith. <laughs> that was like his favorite thing. That, and some of my French teammates would be like, pass the ball to Keith, pass the ball. <laughs> they didn't, but they kind of, they, they did it because they know I wasn't a selfish player. So those two coaches, I really enjoyed playing for them. Did you, ever, did you ever see Crawford Palmer over there? No, obviously, for people who yes. don't know, Crawford Palmer played in Arlington and Washington Lee, played at Duke and then right. played Dartmouth. And um, I believe he's on, he played for the French national team and he's yeah. involved with the French national team today. Did, did you play? Did you get to see Crawford over there? Yes, we played against each other and one year we played together. Oh. You know, definitely one of those guys you want on your team as opposed to playing against them. Because when we played against each other early, we didn't really talk that much. And I was thinking, a lot of times when you're over there and you meet other Americans, you usually think it's going to be cool a little bit, but he was kind of standoffish. Yeah. But then when we became teammates, I'm kind of wondering how it's going to be, and he was the coolest guy. So, yeah, Crawford was a good guy to play with. We played together in Strasburg, and, you know, it was fun playing with him, man. He played hard. It was, it was definitely fun playing with him. Yeah, that's that's great. Well, look, let's let's talk a little bit about your your coaching your coaching career. So, uh, you know, all basketball players at some point you got to hang up their shoes. At least yeah. as a professional, and you got to you got you got to look at other types of, uh, of of jobs. So you got into coaching, um, and you kept you went to Highland in um, in Loudoun County, which I know was upgrading the program. So how how did that how did that come to be? Well, you know, when I was when I knew I was about to retire in '03. I was I was friends with the athletic director at the time. His name was Gary Lee. Uh, and even prior to that, when I was a pro, I would come home and talk to Gary Leak's basketball camps because he was in Rappahannock County, which was like 20 minutes, 30 minutes from Culpeper. And so he becomes the athletic director there. And when I was about to retire, he had a job opening because their program was just starting to get going. And it was like perfect timing. It was like, it wasn't no take a year off or two years off or figure it out. It was like, I retired, ended up going to Highland, coaching the, uh, at this private school. And of course this, these kids, they, you know, their season, I looked up, I looked them up and their season prior to this year weren't, wasn't that good. So I knew it was going to be a, a challenge, but it was a fun challenge. You know, when you get to be a head coach early in your career, you know, being able to make all the calls, make all the adjustments, make things, you know, the practices, the X and O's, is the travel. You kind of understand the leadership role that you're going to have to take on. And I was like, yeah, I, this is the head coaching job. I can, I can handle that. But then after leaving there to go back to East Tennessee State to get my degree, because I hadn't finished when I left in 91, I was really gung-ho on making my NBA dreams come true. So the academic side, I just kind of threw that to the side. But now at this point, you're back now and you get an opportunity to go back and get that. So I did. Mm -hmm. And that led me to being a high school coach in Science Hill up in Johnson City, which had, which was okay. And then Richard Morgan at Bluefield got me on the college level. So that was my first opportunity with the college kids. And who was, I, like? Who was like who was like coaching? Who was like coaching with Richard? I know, I know it was, good. Like it was good. I mean, Coach Morgan was, you know, anytime you play for you coach and you work with somebody that you're used to seeing play. I remember seeing Rich play at UVA. You know what I'm saying? Always stylish. You know what I'm saying? He definitely had some showmanship about him. He could dunk on you. You know what I'm saying? So when when I'm recruiting and you got to tell the, the recruit who you're, you know, who you're about to play for, some of them didn't understand how good he was, you know? You know, he gave me that opportunity and I really, you know, learned that these kids, even at the NAIA level, these are the same players that I've seen. You know what I'm saying? I've seen the top player. I've seen the player that don't get to play that much. I've seen the player and I played with the player that wanted to transfer. So I knew how to talk to all of these people because I've either played with them or I had seen them, you know? And so I, I relished in that opportunity. I did a lot of skill development, but I knew I was going to be good at that because I was that type of point guard that, like I said earlier, I'm going to pass the ball to you to see where you like it. I'm going to give you some ideas to try to help your game get better, whether you're a post player or a guard. So I knew I was going to do well. And then, you know, after five years of working with him, he, he wanted to go in another direction. And then Lee's McCray, a, a guy named Steve Harden, this is how the world works. He happened to be the women's coach at Bluefield when I was an assistant. And so when he got the men's job here at Lee's McCray, 
he called me along and I ended up got to work with him at the division two level. So going from the NAIA level to the division two level, it was definitely a change. And uh, the talent was a little bit better. So now you get to understand, you know, what kind of athletes you're getting to work with. And then the women's head coaching job came available. And, you know, after being a head coach once, you want to get that position again. I just didn't know it was going to come on the women's side. But, you know, Craig McPhail, athletic director, he felt like, you know, he's seen me work with the men. So he must have felt comfortable enough for me to try to take on the women's. And, you know, we're struggling a little bit this year. But, you know, I'm going to believe that we're going to turn it around. And we <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the things that you like better about coaching women than coaching men? You know, that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I like the fact that the women, it's hard to say they're more fundamentally sound than the boys because they don't have the same athletic ability, you know, that the guys have. So for them not to have that, but for them still figure out ways to be successful, I like that attitude. I like that thinking. They're more, you know? more, more coachable, really. Yes, right? yes. And, and they're, they're, they're looking for your guidance, you know. Mm -hmm. I think guys, you throw the ball out there, you tell them to go play. They're like, okay, I got you. Let's go play. Yeah. But the girls, they'll get a rebound, but they'll look over at me real quick to be like, what you want us to do? And I'm like, I want you to play, but I'll call something. You know what I'm saying? So I, I think that's the difference. They, they like more direction. But the guys, they they just feel like they can do it. They don't need your direction. Yeah, I, I got. I'm playing my game, coach. I got. I got you. I got you over there. Now, one, one thing about Lee's McCray is it's Division Two, and we don't have a lot of Division Two in Virginia because we have we have Division One. We have lots of Division Three. Only lots of Division, Division Two schools that we have are the, the CIAA schools, uh, Union and, and, and Virginia State. The good thing about Division Two is you can give scholarships. And you, and you can't get that in Division Three, so the, right. so it's really an opportunity a lot of people in Virginia don't even think about because we don't have access to a lot of Division Two schools. I mean that that does make a difference, you know. Here at least McCray, you know, we get a we get scholarship, we get a certain amount of scholarships, but I kind of got to divide it up through my whole team. And if I carry a roster of like now, I got sixteen girls, mm -hmm. try to make sure everybody gets some type of athletic aid to help out as you can to try to secure your future, so to speak. Right. So yeah, so I try to get, get my girls as close as I can to a zero balance. But when you're trying to build a program and you're, you recruit some girls that they say, I need a full scholarship, and sometimes that kind of ties out with hands because it's tough to give one girl that because now that makes everybody else's money really go down. And then you got to put somewhat a little bit of pressure on that girl. If I'm giving you a full scholarship, you got to understand you got to really perform, you know, I, this ain't money that we got lying around where it's here, you take it, but you don't work hard. Nah. So when you miss out on some players that, you know, if they come to your program, they're going to make a difference, but they won't come unless it's a full ride opportunity. Mm -hmm. So yeah, challenge, but you know, here at my program, man, I just try to give them all the opportunities in the weight room, in the classroom, just personal with me just to get better. And, you know, some of them want to take advantage of them. Some of them don't. All you can do is just keep trying to coach. And, and for me, I love to win championships. That was That's a goal. But I love the fact that my girls are graduating and they're getting a chance to get their lives started, too. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good balance. Yeah, I mean, pro basketball is such a dream. You, get, you just get those girls, get the girls going in the right direction. That's, that's all a coach and a leader can, can, can really do. You know, you look back, you've had this incredible career. Um, what, what are the lessons learned? So when you when you go back, uh, I don't think a person can accomplish more in basketball than you did with what you were given. I mean, you 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 made the most of the uh, of your God given ability. You played at a very high level, highest level. You won championships. You saw the world. You know, a, a guy from Culpeper. You know, a small town in Virginia. Uh, so you you accomplished a lot. You've helped kids. You motivated people. What are your what are your lessons learned? What are things you look back on? These are things I'm going to tell the next generation to do. I could have done maybe a little bit better. I mean, well, the, a, a couple of things that come to mind, the first one would be being able to handle disappointments, you know, injuries. Uh, even though I wasn't academically ineligible, but you coach some people that are academic ineligible and you start to realize they understand how much they miss it once they have to sit out. Um, those two things, 
like I said, if I would could talk to my younger self, I would try to prepare myself for that. Because when I first blew my knee out, and you got to understand the roller coaster I was on, because I just made the NBA, you just make it to where your dream is coming true. And then this happens. And then you go through that why me stage. Hmm. I kind of wish I would have been tougher during that stage, because it, it was a lot of came down my eyes, because I didn't know if I'm going to get to go back to the NBA, you know, a lot of doubt crossed my mind. Like I'm five, seven, and I got one bad knee. I'm going to be playing against six, two, six, three, six, five guys with two good knees. How am I going to do that? You know how, but then you look within yourself and you figure out how you can make it happen. So sometimes I don't realize if thinking that is a good thing, is that a motivating thing? Or do you just take what's given with you and, and push it away quick enough and then really attack the rest of your life. That that was one of the life lessons I learned because I just had a hip operation, hip replacement not too long ago. Mm -hmm. The fact that I went through my both of my injuries when I did this one, I was a little apprehensive at first, but I haven't felt better since doing it. Well, so awesome. now I'm thinking in a way of if it happened early and I acted this way, now if it's happening now, how are you going to act the second time around? You know, I think you got to learn. If you don't learn from mistakes or if you don't learn from things that happen, if it comes back around, you're missing the point. And I think life is too short for you to go around missing points when you got people you can talk to, other mentors that give you good knowledge to try to help in your decision making. Because, you know, they're saying of here today, gone tomorrow, you know, I've lost some teammates, some close friends, and, you know, you just know you must be here for a reason. So you got to make the most of it. And I learned those two things now. Yeah. Well, look, Mr. Jay, I, I just want to thank you for doing this. Uh, you've touched a lot of people. The, the, the women who play on your team are very lucky that, that they're, they're playing for you and they're learning from you, not just thank how to play basketball, but life lessons. But and I, I'm, I'm so uh, grateful uh, for, to see for, for connecting us and that, for you, you to do, do this. I mean, you truly are an inspiration to all us little guys who try to play basketball under five foot ten. Uh, and <laughs> to do your to do your thing right. at a high level. I mean, you, just, you, you just kept you just kept surprising people your whole career. And you know, it's it's too bad your knee was blown out. Who knows what you would have done? But you know what? You 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 kept doing it, and you you know you you played overseas. You you won um, MVP awards. So it's just an amazing career you had. I'm just I'm just really grateful you that you did this. Thank you, man. I mean, I think all basketball players or all athletes. You know, when I played the game, I never played it for the, the glory of it. But, you know, watching the greats like Michael Jordan and uh, Magic and Bird, you know, you see these guys play a good regular season. And at the end of the season, you get those type of awards. And when you get that first time, when that really happens to you for the first time, you're like, wow. You know, you don't think much about it. But then your career is over and you start looking around and you start thinking about, like you just said, where you've been over the world and what you've accomplished. and you know, you really start to learn to be thankful that you had the opportunity to do this, to impact people. It always thrilled me that knowing that something I did on the basketball court could make uh, somebody I don't know stand up out of their seat and yell and scream at the top of their lungs. It was it was always a good feeling, which means I had to work on my game to give them that feeling. So it was a lot of it was for the people. I mean, it was for myself, but I wanted to make other people happy and you know, like I said, I try to be nice. I want people to be nice to me, so I got to be nice to you. Mm -hmm. And I just wish everybody the best. I wish a happy new year to all your listeners, and thank you for having me on this. I know it's a lot of basketball, great basketball in Virginia. You <laughs> know, and when people want to talk about their state, I feel comfortable talking about the ones I know in Virginia and the ones you've interviewed. You've done a great job, and I like to pick your brain one of these days about some of the people you've talked to just to see what you've learned or maybe some of the most inspirational things you received from some of your uh, prior uh, interviews. But thank you for having me, Jay. I really appreciate it. I had a great time. Well, I'd love to do that. Maybe maybe we'll do a follow-up one day and we'll, and we'll talk about things I've learned from um, players. But especially I look forward to that. Coaches, the coaches I've talked to. I, I look forward to that. that. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, yes. we'll keep in touch and we'll follow up. And if you're ever in the D.C. area, your team is playing or just in the area, let me know. We'll, we'll get some coffee or some, or some lunch, or lunch or something. Sounds like a plan. We'll definitely make that happen. Okay. All right, Mr. Mr. Will, good luck for the rest of the season, okay? Thank you, man. I appreciate you. I'll be in touch. You have a great day. Oh, that's good. Keep in touch, okay, buddy? Yes, sir. Okay, all right, man. Take care. Peace out, y'all. All right. Thank you.